to all students of UPP 045. Uh, this week, week eight, we're looking at question analysis. Um, I know that perhaps, given that we've looked at some of this material before in week seven, uh, that this perhaps will become a little bit repetitive, but as far as I'm concerned, it's probably one of the most important aspects of this particular course. Uh, and the reason I say this is because it takes the abstract, in other words, our ideas around research and actually puts them into a, a context, in this case, a university, where for the most part, during your academic careers, you'll be asked many questions, uh, be it essay questions, just simply be it assignment tasks, that will involve you doing some sort of analysis of a question. And the reason I put it into research, because I, I feel, or at least figure, that you need a concrete basis on which to actually apply the research skills that you're gaining through this course. Um, so, for the next at least week or so, we're going to be looking at how we can actually extract information from the questions we're given as assignments, uh, and then what we do with them in terms of doing research, etc. If I say nothing else in this recording, I think what I've said in s on slide three, which is information literacy and research skills, need to start from a solid initial understanding of the task for which the student is seeking information, uh, is perhaps the most important thing that I'll say out of this week. So in other words, everything starts there. The question analysis is the platform, or the base from which you can actually begin doing research and from which hopefully, in other words, the, the things that you get from your actual research that can be utilised and used to actually complete a task. So for me, it's probably the most important statement I'll, s I'll say this week. Now from personal experience, um, if you have a look at slide four, um, the statement that I've made there is fairly self-evident. Uh, however, it's quite difficult to kind of, I guess, gauge from, from all of my experience across marking essays, etc., how often this occurs. Um, and what I'm trying to say here is that people either don't answer a question correctly, in other words, they've misunderstood certain instructions, certain emphases that may be on a particular question, um, or they only answer a question in parts, and they may do it extremely well, um, but they haven't actually answered the question fully. Now what normally happens is that there's a rubric um, that is actually related to every task that you do, all your assignments are measured against a rubric. Uh, with that rubric we then judge the grades that you should be given uh, against a whole range of competencies which are within that rubric. Now if you've only partly answered a, a question, uh, then you can only get those parts of the rubric that you've met, the other parts that you've, or, uh, that you've missed sorry, or you've omitted. Um, ultimately, are simply left blank. Equally, if you answer a question wrongly, in other words, you've misunderstood the task and you address it in an incorrect manner, uh, you cannot achieve those particular grades which are marked on a rubric. Um, rubrics are designed for equity and is a tool that can be used consistently across all the assignments that you get. But I have to say from my experience, again, I'm sorry if I bore you with these particular sort of anecdotes, um, is that uh, my experience in England was that we ha I had some extremely eloquently written pieces of work. In other words, they were, were exceptionally well written, well read in terms of the research that was being used to inform them. However, because the question was misunderstood or misrepresented in some way, um, the people who wrote these wonderful pieces of work uh, never received the, the marks that they possibly could have achieved had they actually had a full appreciation of what the question involved. Now if you look on slide six, um, I've given you a four step process uh, of question analysis to, to look at, to review. Uh, for me, if you follow these guidelines, essentially you should be able to address any question that, pop, you know, that pops up across any course. And those four, and I'll reiterate, I, I know you guys can all read this, um, but sometimes it's worth reiterating some of these points. Um, number one is read the whole question twice. In fact, I would say read it 15 times, if that's the case, if you don't understand it fully. But usually on the first read, you're simply getting, a, I guess, an overview of what a question may involve. But on the second one, you start to look at the nuances, the idiosyncrasies of those particular questions. Um, I would, like I said, read it as many times. If you ever have any doubts about the nature of a question, in other words, what's the emphasis of that particular question, what should you be focusing on, for me, it's always you know, you always get some sort of second opinion. Uh, it's worth actually talking to peers about these things, but if it's still not clear, um, the best port of call is your tutor. Um, 
they'll give you clarity around these things, particularly if it's a very brief question, um, and, and offers very little detail in that sense. Now, in number two, I've put identify the subject, content, or topic words. So what this means is literally pulling apart um, the different aspects of a question. In this case, the subject. So what is the question about? So what's the thing, the topic, the subject, etc.? Uh, and then you've got to try and work out what the content is related to it. And inevitably, if there are topic words that relate to that particular subject, and providing all of those words are used in the context of your assignment in some way, and I would be explicit about this, that you use the words that are in the question uh, throughout your assignment in some form or other. Obviously, don't do it gratuitously, but do it in a way that actually makes it clear that you understand what's being asked of you, but also that you demonstrate your understanding of those particular things. Number three is simply a statement about what you have to do. So you literally work out the steps you have to take to fulfill the particular task. Um, and these are often clearly put in instructional words. Number four, which simply says identify the key aspects in this particular question. Uh, what are the limiting, restricting or focusing words? And, and inevitably in each question there are there is some sort of limit or some sort of bounds or parameters that you have to actually adhere to. Otherwise, you couldn't literally respond to questions that are so large, so big, um, particularly if you've got a word count. Anyway, uh, using the example on slide 7, um, I've posed a question. In this case, discuss the relationship between literacy and academic success within the context of secondary and tertiary education. Now, in the case of this question, the subject is the relationship between literacy and academic success. So they're trying to look at correlations between the two, if, the, if, they, if indeed they exist. Now in the case of our question, the instruction is to discuss, which to me is probably one of the broadest and most general instructions you can get. In other words, you have to consider a whole range of things um, and talk about them in a way that is, uh, is general. I mean, you can get specific, but uh, it's a fairly general discussion about things. Uh, and for me, this is one of the kind of one of the easiest instructional terms that you can get within a, uh, an essay or assignment, because other things like critically evaluate, as I put in here, or describe or analyse, involves much more detail, and you have to have a greater knowledge and a greater depth of understanding about a particular topic to actually engage in, in a critical evaluation, for instance. Whereas discuss uh, is a much more general term uh, and allows for much more latitude in what you can actually include in your attempts to answer that particular question. Now if we're looking at the focus or the limiting words that are within our question, or at least the question we're examining at this point, um, we would look at the actual words that say the context of secondary and tertiary education. They are the limits. So we're only looking at those two sectors. We're not looking at primary education. We're not looking at any other sectors like ESOL, etc. We're taking one or should we would say, well, I suppose it's two, but it's the upper upper levels of education rather than the lower or lateral levels of education. So in this case, we've got a fairly clear guide, a clear boundary of what we have to consider within our discussion. In a much broader sense, if I was looking at a question this for, for my own purposes, uh, the first thing I would ask and try and define is, is what is literacy? So I would actually have to actually define that within the context of my assignment. And that's, a, a, I guess, a small bit of advice that I would give you. Always define your terms. I've mentioned that elsewhere in other lectures. Uh, but actually defining your terms. What does literacy mean? And also, I would need some sort of definition about what academic success means. Does it simply mean passing a course? Or does it mean more than that? Um, I would also have to define things like tertiary education uh, and have some sort of boundary around what I include in that, um, is it simply being at university, or are there other, other strains or other versions of education that might, might be considered tertiary? Anyway, I'd need some sort of definitions around those particular things before I even started. Now, what other questions I might ask myself is, is there a link to begin with? Is there any link between literacy and academic success? So how, what I would do is start to investigate the nature of literacy, uh, and obviously the, the nature of achievement and success. Uh, and how and whether there has been any research done into these things. So is there some correlation between um, early, uh, 
early literacy success with students, you know, in other words, that they're doing well in literacy, uh, and then how they perform from, say, primary education to secondary. Now, in this case, you may have to tip your hat to primary, even in passing, mention that perhaps there is a correlation. But more importantly, if you do have measures of literacy in secondary, uh, how those then translate into success at university, if there is any. Um, I would question every notion of this. You know, in other words, th even, the, even the idea that there may be a relationship, there may be no relationship at all. There may be other factors that are involved in academic success. And I suspect there are, or at least I know there are. Um, however, literacy may be a big factor. And I suspect that would have to be at least dealt with fairly significantly in relation to the question, even if you only, you know, again, tip your hat to other aspects of academic success. Always good practice not to kind of go on too many tangents unless it has some sway or some bearing on ideas, in this case, of academic success. Um, on slide 11, I've given you in three different colours uh, ways of kind of analysing a question. And you can do this by either highlighting a, you know, aspects of a question or underlining or whatever you want to do, but as long as you can actually identify these things. So the three things that I'm looking at um, are in instruction words, topic words and restricting words. Now I've provided two examples there that actually give us not only the context in which we're actually meant to be looking at you know, where, the qu where the question focuses, but also what we have to do with that. So in the, in the first example, what is meant by economic dualism in a Japanese context? So we have to actually simply define what those things mean in a particular context, uh, which is fairly straightforward, I would, I would argue. Now, the second example, which again is fairly straightforward, discuss is the instructional word, uh, and again a very general statement. Uh, so in other words, if you're looking at a question like the impact of colonial rule on British colonial before 1870, uh, you would look at more or less all aspects of colonial rule and what impacts they may or may not have had on, on British colonial before 1870. So again, if we look at, at that last example, the restricting term is before 1870, so we've got to look back during that period, whatever period that may be, uh, and work out what those impacts were and discuss them. Uh, and again, it can be done in a general way, um, which, is a which is the best kind of uh, assignment task to do, because like I said, you're not bound by certain, I guess, more difficult points of a question. By this I mean if you're asked to critically analyse, uh, it would mean that you would have to go in depth with great detail and examine what the impacts were and, and obviously establish if there were larger impacts in certain areas or certain regions, etc. But you'd have to know a lot more detail. Discuss gives you fair, a, a free hand in that sense. And what I should say uh, in reference to kind of slide 12, there's no hard and fast rules about this sort of stuff. Question analysis is something that you'll get good at as you go along, um, and even if you start off having difficulty with understanding what is required of a question, you'll soon find out that your lecturers generally uh, are good, give you advice, uh, give you points of focus, etc. Um, and once you begin to understand what the reasoning is or the rationale behind questions, even if they appear obscure, um, you'll find it much easier to do it yourself. Um, it's simply a case of usually looking at the material you've been taught in class during the lectures and that which has been followed up in tutorials and that the questions m usually have derived from that material. So you've actually already learnt what, what you should be writing about, in other words, what the question relates to. All it's a matter is putting it in the right context and the right focus, as I've said several times. My hope is this week, uh, if you have a look on slide 13, uh, that you'll you'll attempt the question analysis exercise, uh, that you'll read through analysing the title, um, and also look at the resource Reading in Stages by Turner. Um, these are, I think, are fairly reasonable kind of exercises. If nothing else, they'll reinforce what's being stated here and what you've done through the, le through the, um, the lecture or the tutorial for last week. Moving away from the PowerPoint, which is fortunately very brief this week, um, I want to briefly talk about the assessment. Um, in this case, it's assessment three. It's your third and final assessment. Um, I've changed the question from last last term. The question is, um, educational attainment is determined by wealth. Discuss. Now, without doing too much analysis, because you should all be proficient at doing that by now, 
Um, I want you to break that question down and work out exactly how you go about discussing a particular topic like this. Um, the roots of the question are um, come from well, they come from research that I looked into in the UK, which suggested that the a, a child uh, from the poorest background would be eclipsed by a child from the wealthiest background, uh, who's not very bright, uh, would be eclipsed by the age of seven, depending on what schooling they're going to. If the poorest child is going to a state school, the ability, their ability would progressively fall uh, over time, uh, or certainly would not keep up with the students who come from the wealthy backgrounds, um, who attend private schools, um, in, in which case they're smaller class groups, they get much more attention from their teachers, um, and they get versed in things like um, peripatetic reading, um, remedial reading, etc. Um, that you find that, that, like I said, these children have greater opportunities, th that is, wealthy children, have greater opportunities to succeed at education due to circumstances, uh, and as I've said, opportunities that certainly are available to poorer children in state schools. Now for me personally, I, ha I, I kind of got quite annoyed at this. I went through the state schooling system here in Australia, um, found that I, I, I guess I took the opportunities that I had, but, but noticed that one of my good friends who went to a grammar school had very different opportunities and he had, I, I would argue, much greater success at not only his schooling but also his career which followed afterwards. It took me a lot longer to actually get in a position where I could follow him professionally. And I put that down to uh, his education. Um, he, he had a lot more opportunities than I did. Uh, he would tell me the things that he was doing uh, that I certainly didn't have. Uh, and though I didn't mean, though I, you know, I, I feel nothing bad towards the schooling that I had, you know, I, I think I think the teachers did the best they could in the circumstances. Uh, it's, it's obvious that funding at the time had gave him a very different educational experience than I had. So the roots of this question for me are about actually working out whether these two are tied together. Is wealth a determinant of how well you do in education? So if we did a measure of children who went through, you know, say grade 10 or even grade 12, we did a measure of their success rates in certain subjects, would they be mirrored? In other words, would they be the same? Or would there be higher achievement um, with people who have more money? Now, the key here is that there's three things that you have to do. So you actually have to do a question analysis. So I've put here, you've got part A, part B, part C. Now in part A, you have to identify the key subject words in the topic. Use these terms to carry out a search and summons. And you have to keep that search, those search terms, so to speak. Record your search strategy terms using the template provided. Now I've given you a separate sheet on Milo, which is an online word template for assessment three. Uh, that actually simply gives you a performer in which you can actually put all your information in for the whole of assessment three. Now, please take note that in part B, you've got 10 items that you've got to select uh, that are, and that are suitable in terms of answering this question. They have to be academic sources, and we've already been through the reliability material. Uh, but you have to justify your response or your choice for keeping a particular um, article or source, and you have to justify it in around 100 words for each one. So effectively, you've got a 1,000 words to write beyond putting all the bibliographical details and so on in. But this is important. I want you to kind of identify and tell me why you're using the sources you're using. Now, in part C, you've simply got to compile a separate reference list uh, with using Harvard as the referencing style. This has to be done well. It's going to be literally put through the rigours as part of the rubric, so actually your grades are dependent on it, or at least doing it well. Um, I'm hoping, for the most part, that the books that you use are going to be available in full text. Uh, if they're not, you have to kind of tell me why you've decided to use one that's, that hasn't. What I would say also is I would do some reading of the material you're finding rather than just getting the bibliographical details and making some sort of judgment uh, according to that in terms of its justification and, and your use of it. Uh, I was hoping you can give me some sort of background into the, into the question itself. You know, what, what sort of answer have you come to just even through your incidental reading of the material that you get. Now, there's no task length because um, I, I, I generally don't like to set parameters like that. I, I 
assuming that most people write at least a thousand words because that's what I'm asking for in part B but if you don't do that that's okay as well um, but what I'm hoping for is that like I said it's fairly comprehensive uh, the more detailed it is in every respect across all the parts of this assessment uh, the greater chance you have of getting uh, good marks um, remember that it's due in week 13 on Monday the 27th of May uh, it's a hard copy submission though I'll put a drop box up just in case um, certainly for distant students um, but like I said hard copy seems to be uh, a reasonable way to submit it certainly for attending students but anyway um, like I said we'll just leave that up to you uh, there's a bit of information more on the actual task sheet which I've put up there um, read through it you know, quite clearly and accurately make sure you understand the task fully um, and beyond that have a great week uh, and if you've got any questions ask Julie or send me an email uh, regarding the assessment. Anyway, have a good one. See you later. Bye.